Hello, everybody. This is Rob uh, Fredette with HodgePod, and I have a special guest today, Jeremiah Emporphy. He is from Toronto, Canada. He's a stand-up comedian and author, and I'm looking forward to talking to him today about what he does up there in Canada, and we'll talk about his book as well. First of all, Jeremiah, welcome to my podcast, HodgePod. I'm really happy to uh, have you on today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me, man. Thanks. So uh, you are a stand-up comedian, so when you are a stand-up comedian, uh, for me, if I had to get in front of a crowd, I'd have stage fright. I'd like my, I'd freeze. So how long did it take you to uh, become a comedian? Did you have to think about it or is it st- something that sprung up and uh, did you get stage fright or did you get nervous? And then uh, what was your first performance? Like I'm throwing a lot at you. So how did you get into stand up comedy? Uh, well, the way I got into it was I was just watching a lot of stand up, just watching it on TV, kind of specials. And then I just got the thought of, oh, I want to try that. So I started writing some stuff, uh, but they weren't really, I didn't really understand how joke structure worked. So then I posted them on Reddit. I'm like, oh, this is me workshopping material. And then they, those got roasted and it was like, you don't understand joke structure. And I got bullied online <laughs> before I even started <laughs> by people on Reddit. But that's how I learned how joke structure worked. So then it took me about a year to actually go from that thought and like writing stuff and thinking about it to just going and just doing it. So, yeah, so that's what I did. Uh, and now the stage fright was for the first time, mostly. Uh, and the first few times after that. But after, I think, like, a couple months, then it started to slowly subside. And I just slowly started to get into the groove of really doing it. I've seen some of your performances online. So how would you describe what your material is like when you're I, – I, I thought it was very good. It was funny. So what, how would you describe your your material when you're out there performing? Uh, I'd say I have a lot of really just dark, edgy things that are horrible to say, but very <laughs> funny. <laughs> so horrible, but it's like, I like making people laugh when they're thinking like, oh, I shouldn't laugh at that. That's my material. And I just, that's the kind of comedy that I do. And that's the kind of comedy <laughs> for the most part that I love to do. And just saying like com- opinions that are just like controversial and just like really digging into that like dirty side of humanity and just like society and all that. And that's just kind of my material. It's not mean. I didn't think it was mean when I saw it. I thought it was, I thought it was very good. And uh, sometimes you need a little levity and uh, you can do that with uh, comedy. And I think it's a good thing. So, yeah, I I don't know. I, if I were to get in front of a crowd, I'd, I'd freeze. So, um, so you have to do a lot of preparation for uh, being a comedian. How long did that, does it take to do a performance and uh, how long, what's the prep like? or for performance and uh actually when you get it what's the time like preparing sure. and being out there uh in terms of prep usually if i'm doing new stuff i'll have to rehearse it at home in my room and just like hmm. work through it so i just rehearse a few, a few times i'm just like okay hey, this is what i'm gonna say this is the ideas i'm gonna say but as time has passed i actually find that i have to prep less because it's like all my established material is just in my head I know it off by heart, so I don't have to rehearse that. Wow. But it, it's usually just like once I write some stuff, it'll just be like a couple of days of rehearsing it before I'm ready to just try the new stuff out. Um, so, yeah, it's not that. It's actually not too much preparation. Did you get any uh, who did you get insp- inspiration from as far as comedians? Uh, you know, did you get any inspiration from anybody who's in the uh, in the world of comedy? Yeah, I mean, I'd say Chris Rock is probably Louis C.K. are probably the top two that I really love. Mm-hmm. But uh, in terms of smaller comedians, I really like Dimitri Martin. Uh, he's like a he's he's still pretty famous, but he's just like if you're like a comedy fan, you would know him. Uh, and I just uh, I really love Mike Birbiglia too. Like he's a storytelling comedian, so I'm trying to get more into telling stories and weaving a long kind of uh, thread. So that's, but those are probably my top influences in terms of stand up. So while I was doing research uh, for this uh, podcast episode, you also have a, uh, a comedy production company. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So what's right. that like? How is that uh, built into your, uh, you and do you help out other comedians? Yeah. So pretty much all it is is just uh, I produce stand up comedy shows just locally in Toronto. And then I also use that company to produce shows out of town uh pretty much it's just like it helps networking because it's like you ask other comedians to get on the show and then they know you 
then you can ask to get on their show. So it's very much like a political, <laughs> securing <laughs> political power. <laughs> that's what it, that's mostly what it is. And it's like, you know, you make a little bit of money too. So that helps. But uh, yeah, it's just about, and you learn about business and all that and marketing through doing that. So that's kind of the main reasons for it. And it's, it's tough business, but uh, you know, it's great. I also, uh, uh, while getting ready for this, you were also a screenwriter. What was that like? screenwriting is uh pretty that's pretty big time stuff so what what was that like and what did you actually do I found that to be pretty interesting yeah uh well it's actually funny because before I started writing just like books which is what I do now I started Mm -hmm. screenwriting which is I just I kind of had this like writing bug in me for a while of just like thinking enjoying it a lot but never having the work ethic to do it and then one day I kind of watched a YouTube video on screenwriting and then I just started writing five pages a day uh I think the first thing I wrote was I think it was a tv series I, it was like a mini series that was really terrible it was probably no one will ever see it it was just awful stuff but uh then I wrote a movie uh which was also pretty terrible uh but you know it was just breaking into writing and I had a lot of fun doing it because screenwriting is a lot less detail you just kind of it's more character focused and yeah but yeah, that's just how I broke into it. Um, and then I started writing books because I realized that when you write a book, you can just put it out and it's a lot easier to do where it's screenwriting. You have to have like $10 million to make a movie, uh, the kind of movie I would want to make. Huh. So, yeah. So you have a book. What's the name of the book? Cause I'm going to get it and read it. Uh, but uh, just for our, my listeners, what was the name of the book that you wrote? And it's part of a series, is it not? Yeah. Uh, the book is called hive. Uh it's a dystopian alien invasion sci-fi novel uh pretty much about uh there was an alien invasion onto earth uh years ago and it like pretty much decimated what earth used to be but then humans managed to beat it but they didn't fully beat the alien the alien is still crawling around on earth causing trouble and then slowly they start to discover that it's stronger than they originally thought and there's more to it than they originally thought so, yeah. Well, I've had authors on my podcast and uh, for the authors I've had, it's gone from two years to 12 years to write a book. So mm-hmm. how long did it take you to write it? And uh, I'm sure there's a certain discipline to do that for me, for this podcast. I use some, a lot of my free time at night. You know, we have a, I have a real time job. So at the time I do a lot of research to uh, get ready for it. So what was that like writing, getting the concept of the book, and then also finding that discipline and traction to get it written? Uh, Well, it took, I believe it took two years or hovering around two years to get it complete. And the discipline just really came down to just sitting down and doing it every day. Um, And it's just about if anyone wants to build that, it's really about just building the habit of doing it. So for me, it would be an hour before work. um, And then I would also come home and write after work or when I would do stand up, actually, Mm -hmm. I'd be at open mics. And this is when I was first starting and I would just sit there in the corner and write because you have to wait for like an hour before the show even starts. Really? Oh man, I'd be freaking out. I'd be like, I'd be pacing if I were yeah. doing <laughs> yeah, I'd be pacing. I, mean, I couldn't time, sit yeah. still. Yeah. The first few times. Yeah. But then it was just like, after I was just like, okay. So then I managed to just like get the time in and just doing it every day. And just like, even when you don't want to do it, once you get those few words, your first few words in, then you start and also hitting a goal too of like oh i want to write this many words every day that's the thing that just like and then you slowly move forward and build momentum so yeah interesting so like uh when you were writing the book did you have to like go back and did you have to like go back and read and maybe say i didn't like this and maybe change it that must be is it frustrating or is it uh whatever you get down after you revise it that's that's the right part of the book yeah i mean i did uh six drafts for this one so there was a lot of revising and figuring things out because it was also my first draft, uh, first book, right? So then it was just I was just learning how to write a book, learning how a book actually works, and then you know major ideas that I thought were just oh yeah this is going to be a part of it and ended up getting completely scrapped and tossed out, mm-hmm. and then certain things just slowly came to me as I was writing it. So the first draft is unrecognizable from the last draft pretty much uh yeah but there's a lot of cutting stuff cutting a lot of your work that you end up really? probably is going to be in there 
so when you say six drafts, you it's like six full books. Yeah, oh, yeah, that yeah. Is? There's a lot of it. Six full books. Really? Well, that's what that's the way I did it. Uh, wow. So, yeah, but I wouldn't have done that. Yeah, I mean, it was a mistake to do it that way because with my second book, I was managed to take large chunks, and it's mm-hmm. like okay, I like this, and I was managed to transfer it. But with the, the first one, I just like rewrit the whole whole thing. So for you, when you uh, when you did when you yeah. conceived of the book. Did you have to think of a like a story and then develop characters, or do you develop characters and develop the story? How did that work? Because I I find that interesting because you have to get to from the start to the finish. Yeah, uh, for me it was I had a bit of an outline first, so I had the what the I had the basic plot, just a bunch of basic beats, a few paragraphs of what was going to happen, and then I had an idea of who the characters were, but in terms of the nitty gritty of the details of how hey, this character gets here, or this is this character's personality, that was all conceived while I was writing it. So I find that it was a mix of planning and also figuring things out as I go along. Hmm. That's yeah. that's interesting. So um, the book has been out for, what, a couple of years now? Yeah, a couple of years. And then you have another book that you're going to be writing in the series as well? Uh, yeah, I have a second book that's now finished, and it's just now wow. getting it to an editor. So... That should be out next year sometime. So, yeah, that one took a little longer, but it's a lot better. And, uh, yeah, I'm excited to for the readers uh, who's a fan to check out what happens. Cool. Um, and what about, like, the editor? What does an editor do? Does an editor say, take this out or whatever? How, do, how does that work with the editor? Because they're the, you know, they, they guess they give the final proof, right? So yeah. what does an editor do? Because, you know, we think of an editor, but... What do they do? Do they make recommendations or how do they go? How do they uh, let you know what, you know, what works and what doesn't? Yeah. Well, there's a few different types of editors. So there's, there's a thing called a development editor and there's also beta readers, which is people who, who give them their book and then they give their opinions on the major things, the major issues such as plot, the characters, what connects with them, what the book needs more of, what's to them seems like it doesn't matter. What's confusing because as a writer, as it's, when you do your stuff, it's like you're so involved in it that mm-hmm. you need fresh eyes to see here's their opinion on it. So then the, the developmental editors and beta readers help you with the plot. And then there's also a, a copy editors and proofreaders, which is more the grammar, the structure, the details, punctuation of, to really finalize. So it's well written. Hmm. So did you go on a book tour for this uh, for your first book and how did Oh, no, no, not on the first book. The first book was I just put it out there. Wow. <laughs> just started marketing. <laughs> I started marketing after the book was out because I had no idea what I was doing back then. But uh, now things are like, okay, I'm learning a lot more. But the first book, I did not have anything for a book tour. <laughs> wow. Well, then I yeah. think you'll have a book tour for the second book, I would think. So uh, um, how many, uh, when you look down the road, how many how many books would you like to write and maybe would you like to get in different aspects of writing? Yeah. I mean, this series, I have nine books planned. Um, so it's a pretty wow. big undertaking. Uh, it's going to take me well into my thirties. Uh, so yeah, but uh, I mean, I don't think I'll, I am thinking about once that book series finishes getting back into screenwriting. Cause I have some ideas for like a TV show, a couple TV mm-hmm. shows I'd want to make a couple movies. So it'd be fun. Wow. To, yeah. So, but that's like, I mean, these books are going to finish, plan to finish when I'm 38 and I'm 25 now. So yeah. Uh, But yeah, that's just, uh, I think I'm never really going to stop writing. I don't see a reason why I would stop. So yeah. Probably like, uh, maybe they'll uh, put your uh, books into a movie series. Yeah, exactly. And then I'll write the screenplay, be a control freak. I'm like, this (laughs) needs to be in there. (laughs) Yeah. That's wild. That's, that's pretty awesome. So if we go back to uh, being a stand-up comedian, um, when you're in front of the audience, uh, when you get out to the stage, do you get a feel like what the audience is going to be like uh, as far as the, you know, being connected? Or um, is there a sense you get when you get out there on stage, uh, like if you think it's going to be a good show or a bad show or get that feedback from the audience? I mean, you don't really know until you've said your jokes and you try it. Because for me, as I'm a pretty polarizing comedian because I have a lot of that edgier stuff. So for me, it's like, I don't really know what they're into until I've said certain things. And I have certain jokes that are like markers. 
mm-hmm. that are like really out there of like <laughs> they're either on board with this or they're not <laughs> you know it's the kind of stuff that you say where you can't be lukewarm so i kind of once you've said it and once you try some stuff then you get a feel for it but audiences shift and change over time because the same audience can be kind of lukewarm and you can actually uh you know get them pumped up a bit or sometimes they'll start off hot and they'll just go down so you know you don't know do you ever get any people in the audience who are uh get offended or anything like that i mean it's actually pretty rare that doesn't really happen that much it's probably happened i mean i've been doing stand-up for a little over four years and i've only really gotten maybe two or three audience complaints sure i have people who are like uncomfortable and cross their arms but i've only had like two or three audible you know oh, you can't do that <laughs> kind of deal so really. wow yeah that's uh that's pretty interesting so uh you live in canada um i've been to uh vancouver uh and uh you live in toronto now is that correct yeah i'm in toronto yeah so what's it like in toronto my wife and i were going to go to vacation up there in september uh september up there in september and uh we're going to probably go next year we're going to go to uh the rogers center to go see a baseball game but that uh hotel there is very expensive so we got to save up a little bit more so what's it like in toronto because it looks like a fantastic city yeah i mean i genuinely think that toronto is a great city uh a lot i like it a lot more than vancouver because I'm from, I used to live in Vancouver for a while, but I think Toronto, it just has a very thriving uh, lifeblood to it. So, you know, the entertainment scene, the music scene, there's always something to do and there's so many subcultures within it. So it's no matter who you are, because it's such a big city, you're able to always find something. And it's the biggest city in Canada. It's kind of the hub for, you know, financial districts, technology, entrepreneurship all these things so it's a very it has a very fast pace to it uh so don't expect people to help you when you're like do you have directions <laughs> everyone has somewhere to go <laughs> like you know so but yeah it's a great city and uh you know if you're here uh yeah probably gonna see a blue jays game i'm guessing uh, yeah we're gonna go see or... we we're gonna go we're gonna go see a blue jays game probably stay at that rogers Some center hotel guy. Um, I live in Memphis, Tennessee, and it's a lot slower down here. Not slower, but uh, the pace is slower. And uh, you can ask people for directions here in Memphis. So uh, it's nice. But uh, Toronto is um, is never been there, but uh, went to Vancouver a few years ago. That was a really nice city. You know, the drive, we went to Seattle. We drove up, uh, up to Vancouver and uh, experienced it for a day. I thought it was pretty cool. Mm-hmm. What was Vancouver like? I mean, I like Vancouver a lot. I think that I didn't take advantage of the city when I was there. I just, it was just, I was living my life in a weird way because I was doing so much stand up that I didn't really do that much other stuff. Wow. So I didn't really have much of a life. And now it's like I've changed where I'm building a life outside of stand up as well doing it. But, you know, building a life outside of your art is really important. Uh, but I mean, Vancouver, I, I like it. It has a lot of nature, great weather, probably the best weather in Canada because the rest of Canada in winter gets really bad, uh, mm-hmm. very cold. So Vancouver, but Vancouver is great. It has a good art scene as well, but it's just a bit too small in terms of really wanting to do the arts. Do you have a full-time job? Uh, like you have these, you're being comedian, you're writing a book. So do you what do you do? Do you have a full-time job during the day? So you're wearing many hats. So what is that like? I've done yeah. that before. So I know exactly uh, what that's like. Yeah. Yeah. I work at a media agency uh, doing like advertising and stuff like that. So I find that it's a great job because, because I'm learning so much about marketing from huge brands and how they do it. I'm now applying what I'm learning to my personal brand of how or even how I market stuff or how I market shows or how I market books is like, oh, okay. So what they do is they do this and then it's I learn how to take that and then sell. Because selling when you're an artist, you have to sell. That's it's That's it. so yeah. So it's you know, learning how to sell is very important and uh something I wasn't really doing much of before, but now I'm saying like, oh, if I really want to do this, I have to know how to sell. So yeah. Man, oh man! So you've got you've got your own uh, comedy production company. You're a stand up comedian. You have a full time job in advertising, and you've written a book. So, uh, what would you aspire to? People who are achieve want their goal. Um, you got 
a lot of things going on, but what would you tell somebody who would want to achieve a goal? Because don't limit yourself. When I started this podcast, I went back and forth for three years, whether I should do it. And I decided last year to do it. So uh, what would you give some advice to people, you know, achieving their goals? I mean, I think the best advice is like, if someone's thinking about doing a thing, just start, you just got to start and you just got to accept that. For me, I'm not even where I want to be at at all, but it's it's just that it's going to be a long journey. It's going to be a tough journey. You have to have patience and you're going to have a lot of setbacks, a lot of unexpected difficulties. But I think that it takes a while, but then the fruit slowly starts to bear and, uh, and then you get to you know have the rewards. But, you know, you just got to start. That's the thing. You just got to start the thing that you want to do. So what goals do you have? What What are your plans for, like, be, while you're a comedian, do you, uh, you're, been doing it for four years you would think you would get some traction you'll be excuse me more more well known i think that would be a huge uh goal of yours yeah yeah for me it's funny because this year i actually it's this year i actually quit stand-up for a little bit i quit stand-up for about four or five months and now i'm just getting back getting back into it uh but it's like my goal is just to be able to generate income and live off of stand-up and book money Mm -hmm. uh and just build up an audience build up a fan base and just truly make that my occupation instead of having a day job and i feel like i'm moving the sales towards that way it's gonna take a little while but the wheels have started to turn slowly of what i need to do and how i need to do it and i'm heading in that direction so the goal is just to build myself as a brand the items that you're doing now you'll look back at it 20 years from now you're going to be in a different place and it's going to be like wow all the things that you learn now are going to be you know, it's going to be like second nature to you. It's going to be when you see that uh, sometimes you hit obstacles. And when you hit obstacles, you just pick yourself back up, feel sorry for yourself for five minutes and then get going. And no matter how bad it gets, uh, there's always light at the end of the tunnel because uh, there's light, at, you know, each day is a new day. So um, have you met any of the big time comedians or anything like that in your travels? uh nobody big time i i mean i've met like canadian big like people who are doing well in canada but i've never met a big comedian before not yet oh yeah so uh what do you think about the uh chris rock will smith uh incident last year i mean it was what bothered me is how much people cared about it <laughs> that's what bothered me but i mean i think it was a stupid thing to go slap someone over a joke a comedian telling a joke and like a stand-up comedy like environment but i don't know i feel like they just both have too much money and they both need to get slapped because if you're that rich your brain is just like <laughs> you know it's just like i don't know i just don't i find it hard to care uh but you know it, who cares <laughs> that's, that's my thing yeah i was like i was like geez i mean what was that all about i mean he yeah. walked up there casually and just boom i was yeah. like wow but uh so what else is up? Uh, what else uh, do you, uh, as far as you know, being a comedian, do you have to you have to schedule your own shows. So how is that uh, going? And do you have to like audition, or your is your name out there now, so you can pretty much pick and choose where you go? Yeah, I mean, as a comedian, like when I'm I'm now putting together road gigs, and it's literally just trying to find a small town. I make a list of restaurants bars pubs in these small towns mm -hmm. reach out say hey i'm a comedian planning a tour uh if you guys would be interested in having a comedy show like i'll take care of all the marketing costs and stuff uh, if you guys just provide a venue and then wow you know, you message you you email 30 40 people and you get one response and they say no <laughs> and then you message them their 40 and then you get a yes that's kind of how it is you just gotta you really have because canada is there's not a lot of comedy clubs in Canada. So mm -hmm. like British Columbia has one comedy club, real comedy club, which is, so it's like the province is, so it's just, you have to really be entrepreneurial uh, if you really want to figure out how do I hit the road. Hmm. So hmm. for your, when's your next show? Do When's your next performance? Uh, I mean, Sunday, I'll probably hit up a show, uh, but my next road gig is on the 15th, which is something that I'm putting together a place just an hour outside of Toronto, mm -hmm. really small town. Uh, and, you know, I'm just marketing it now. Got a lot of work to do. I'm actually, you know, getting the word out because I'm not a famous person. So you have to literally try to figure out how do I get people who don't know me, don't know there's a show to realize it's a mm -hmm. show. 
to come to it. So that's where you have to mark that's where the marketing comes in of you know having to really figure it out. So yeah. Wow. Going back to uh being in Toronto, um I asked I think I asked you earlier, do you go to any of the sporting events there like the Raptors or the Blue Jays or the Maple Leafs? You know, it's funny. I actually didn't have the chance to because I had a really tough year. Uh, it took me a long time to actually get a good job. So I was working part time for a long time. So I had like no money at all to do anything. But now that I do, I am planning on going to a Blue Jays game. And I do want to hit up a Maple Leafs game when the playoffs hit. And uh, I want to see the Raptors, of course. But it's just like next year because I just didn't have a bankroll to do it. But next year, I'm definitely down to have, have that stuff. So you got the full time job. I, I totally, totally. Uh, when I, when I was uh, in my younger twenties, I was working four jobs and uh, got a full time job. So uh, the grind is there, and uh, you know the fruits of your labor are starting to kick in now. So what else? Uh, what else would you tell us here in the states about Canada? Oh man, I'd say that we're not as nice as people say. <laughs> we're not what? that. No. <laughs> well, I'm in Toronto now because so maybe that's different, but. Small town Canada, people are very nice, but the cities, people are not nice, or people are fake nice, so they'll smile to your face and be like, oh, yeah, let's hang out, but they won't actually, <laughs> I don't know, I think ca- Canadians are just, but I mean, I would say that the major, a lot of the major cities have a lot of thriving art scenes, and we're, we're small, but we're, we have a lot of strong stuff about us. We have, I think that Canadians are hardworking people, and I think Canada's kind of on the come up, especially with media and entertainment. I think that there's a lot of good stuff coming out. Uh, And just to, you know, keep your eye out and give Canadians a chance and let us in your country sometimes. Because for a Canadian to move to America, they have to pay like $20,000 or something or like $50,000. I don't know what it is, but it's like When a a Canadian moves to America, they have to pay money? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to pay to get a visa. Like you have to have like a ridiculous amount of money to do it. Really? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Jeez. Yeah. So, what do people think of Americans down here? The can what do Canadians think of Americans? Uh, I mean, there's a lot of stereotypes like, oh, Americans are obese, Americans are lazy, or whatever. <laughs> there's a lot of mean stuff, but I think that deep down, it's just like it's kind of like when can, when Canadians make fun of Americans, it's kind of like Canadians are like the nerds in school. Who are like making fun of the jocks but it's like you're a nerd like you're just mad you're just jealous that they're tall and have money and like girlfriends and stuff and we're just like yeah america sucks but you know we're pretty easy going together. down here we're pretty easy going my uh my a lot of my uh ancestors and relatives are from uh the montreal area so i oh, can nice. definitely cool. uh i have a certain affinity for canada as well um but uh we're pretty cool down here in the States and we uh, we're neighbors. So I think we, we, we all have a lot in common. And yeah. uh, I think uh, that moggles the mind that you need to pay that type of money to come to the States. My goodness. Yeah. yeah that's quite a bit. I'm curious. You said you had four jobs at one time. Like what were you doing? Yeah. Was- so when I was, I graduated from college in 1988 from the university of Maryland. So yeah. I worked in radio and TV when you're coming out of college back in the late eighties, uh, I was working at a uh, station in Boston, Mass. as a producer, and that was making $4.50 an hour. I was a PA announcer for Northeastern University Basketball. I worked a part-time job at UPS, United Parcel Service, to get the benefits and extra pay, health benefits. And I was, uh, what oh, I did a uh, sport, I did a, I was a sportscaster on, uh, on a radio station in Massachusetts as well. So I was working seven days a week for like three years. I, I just, work 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 so yeah and then i got the full-time gig and um that was uh that's where the hard work comes in but yeah it was something i loved and uh i thoroughly enjoyed it and uh it probably helped me you know with my work ethic you know today so yeah it was uh pretty cool that's yeah that's crazy man because i i work six days a week sometimes too because i also occasionally work at a nonprofit, so it's like just for some extra money and just like yeah so i I've known that grind before of like the six days a week and just having no life. But uh, yeah, it's great. I don't know if I could do it now. I mean, I work, yeah. you know, <laughs> I work now and I go home at night and sometimes I'm like wiped out, you know, and I, I'll yeah. go to the gym and exercise and that's my, you know, it helps keep me, uh, keeps the energy level up. But uh, yeah, the four jobs is just, 
when I think back of it now, it was just like, I was driving all over the place. It just wasn't like working and working five miles. I was, I was driving into Boston to go, to go work, uh, on two of the jobs. Mm -hmm. And, um, so it was, uh, seven days a week. Didn't matter if it was night days, it was just constant, constant working. So, you know, I forget what the, what the minimum wage here now is what $15 an hour it was four fifty when I, uh, when I got graduated from college, that was an hour. So yeah, <laughs> it's incredible how the, the wages have gone up. So, uh, but yeah, it's hard work. What you do now is what, uh, what you're going to thrive the benefits for later on in the future. So, but, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it, the grind is good. I like the grind. The daily grind is good because you really, learn things and you meet new people and learn new experiences. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that, that's true. You know, working hard is always important. And it does, it does feel like, you know, once you finish, you feel like you did something. So it's always a good feeling. Yeah. You want to, you want a sense of accomplishment, Yeah, you know, accomplish something, no matter how small it is, you accomplish something and uh, it could be going out doing errands or whatever, but you accomplish something, you know, you help somebody out, you know, you're giving back to the community and uh but that works yeah but the four jobs so i i definitely uh definitely feel your grind because it's hard work man it's hard work to uh to aspire so uh as far as the book is concerned do you get satisfaction out of when you wrote the book because uh, i see a review here i got some reviews here and it said one person said that uh, this book is anything but predictable it has lots of twists and surprises that keep me guessing about what would happen till the very end I applaud the author for his vivid imagination and crafting such a clever and thought provoking novel. Scott Kahan, think about the the feedback that you're getting. Oh, from I uh, you know, it's it's pretty yeah. it's pretty awesome that you have yeah. somebody who's giving it a five star review. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate the feedback, and even the negative feedback is that I've gotten is I actually agree with what they're saying. It's just like because it's like you know the good stuff and the bad stuff is it's all good, but. I think even with the negative stuff is it, it's made me a better writer uh, moving into the second book and the stuff to watch out for and my flaws in terms of how I am as a writer. So, you know, I'm, I'm okay with it. And, you know, it's averaging at three and a half out of, out, of, out of five stars when I take all the reviews together. So it's saying that, hey, it's not the greatest book ever. It's not the worst book better ever. It's in the middle somewhere. So, and I'm happy with that because it was the first book. So, well, yeah. you did it, you know, people, you know, the people who are the critics, uh, have they written a book, you know, or, or whatnot, but, uh, you've done it and, uh, for criticism, whether it's construct, you know, constructive criticism is a gift. So it helps take it personally. It helps uh, build you up. And that's one thing I have found out as well throughout mm -hmm. my career is, you know, it's okay to get you know, constructive criticism because it makes you better down the road. So, yeah. but, uh, I think that is uh pretty, pretty awesome. So, um, did you get any, uh, I, I don't know if I asked you this, but you get any inspiration from like any books that you've read, fiction books, or any movies that maybe gave you uh, the uh, inspiration for the book? I mean, I don't, I never had any direct inspiration in terms of, oh, I want to write something like this, or like this, watching this movie gave me this idea, but it's more, you know, because I've consumed so much art in my life, is like you, every artist has a bunch of influences. And then it's like you take those influences and then write your own thing. So I love, you know, political drama, but I also love, you know, cheesy, corny sci-fi like Star Wars and just having a big imagination and just writing stuff and having a big world is something that I find interesting. So it's just a culmination of, you know, a lifetime of just consuming art and stories. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting. So uh, as you look down the road here, you said you're going to come out with nine. Was it eight or nine books? Uh, it's going to be nine in the series. Nine books. So yeah. does it look like a daunting task when you think about the books that you want to write? That's a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I think about it. Like I sit down and I think about it. And I'm like, I think, what am I doing? <laughs> Why am I doing this? <laughs> but then it's just when, I, when I'm actually in it, when I'm writing, it's I'm happy because it's all even if this doesn't become, you know, this big thing, I'm going to try my best to make it the best that I can. And the biggest that I can is it's just, it's a purpose driven life. And it's who else can say once it's finished, okay, I did a nine book series, which, you know, so it feels big and it feels scary. And sometimes I regret making that commitment, but 90% of the time when I'm in it, I'm just, Hey, I'm happy. I'm here. Yeah. So, so what, when you, when you write it, do you actually, I'm, I'm going to ask a dumb question here. Do you actually write it on 
pad of paper or do you type it in the computer? No, I just do a uh, computer. Just uh, some people do actually write by hand, but I do computer. I do think if I did it by hand, it would take the rest of my life. <laughs> so I don't really have it in me to do the by hand, but uh, yeah, uh-huh. just in the computer. But... So do you like when you're typing, do you like, eh, I don't like this. or you just keep going and say, move on. Or do you like, you change it midstream. I know I asked you, you know, do you go back and look, but you like change it midstream now that didn't sound right. And then how does that work? Uh, not when I'm actually just writing a draft. That's more when I go in and edit, that's when I go back and rewrite. Uh, I don't really like this. I, that's when I, cause my final draft, I usually just rewrite the prose, which is the actual, all the actual wording and just really make it a little bit better. But most of the time I just let it go, let ideas flow, puke it out and just, you know, and then sift through see what works and what doesn't interesting because uh you know um when uh when people are doing their uh writing books or um you know you know like screenwriting it's amazing that you're able to you know put things on paper and uh you see the fruition from it in a book or on screenwriting and it just may it still gives you satisfaction um when you get it done and you said you have uh, aspirations of doing screenwriting in the future you know if you through this book uh, series. So looking at your career, uh, would you be able to say that you're going to uh, be at a stage where you're going to be um, recognized? I mean, the thing with me is like, I, I want a certain level of recognition, but I don't want, because it's like, I want a level where it's, I can make a living off of it, but not that I get stopped in the street all the time. Like that sounds horrible to me, but for me, it's like being like D-list or C-list famous would be great because as an artist, your income is tied to how well-known you are. So it's like you have to be well-known if you want to really make a certain amount. So, yeah, I mean, I want to be well-known, but just not too well-known, you know? Yeah, so. well, you know, you ever see people like uh, I, I watched like the paparazzi stuff on Instagram, exactly, all these, yeah. all these famous people. And they're just like, they got security around them. They're whizzing by their fans. And it's like, they don't want anything to do with them. Isn't that, isn't that crazy? Like the people like live in a bubble like that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's the thing is it just seems like, it seems like it wouldn't be a real life. Like you're just beyond human. And I think that that level would just mess you up to the point where I don't see how that would be an enjoyable life of wherever you go, you have to have security around you or wherever you go every day somebody a bunch of people are coming up to you that sounds horrible to me so yeah and for freight for really famous people i've always said you know i don't know how their brain functions yeah as exactly. far as, yeah. you know they never they never turn it off i mean yeah. it's always on and, and go to places when it's closed or when their places are closed to like go watch a movie or go get their their driver's license or go eat in a restaurant and it just never it never shuts off so i don't know how people you know, I get through a day of eight, nine hours of work and it's like, I'm wiped. And it's like, I don't know how they get through like, but you know, they got tons of money, but you know, it, it it's must be overwhelming. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That'd be interesting uh, to do like a case study on that to see about uh, famous people, but uh, yeah, if they have different brains, like when they I die, mean, I, 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 mean, I just think it's amazing that, you know, you have fans all around, you got security and people just want to get a picture and they're just like, sunglasses heads down straight yeah. to where they need to go it's like you know these people are you know you i mean they've yeah well watched you through your career to be fair, though i think it's like if you take a photo with one person and you have 50 people there like you just don't have the time to do it like i think it's practical to be like no i can't but if it's like if one person comes up to you i think maybe take the photo but if there's a hundred yeah. people outside it's just like you just can't do it so yeah well, Jeremiah, I want to thank you very much for coming on my podcast. Uh, when you come out with your second installment, I'm going to get this book Hive and I'm going to read it and then I'll kind of have you, may have you come back on. Thoroughly enjoyed it, learning about stand-up comedy, uh, your book, and also living in Canada. And uh, I want to thank you very much for coming on Hotchpot. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you. And if anyone wants to buy the book. Uh, yeah, where on- can you get the book? Yes, oh, sir. Yeah. Where can yeah, you get sorry. the book? Please let uh, me know. Yes. Get- you know, just on Amazon, uh, but if you want a free preview of the book, it's available on my website, www.jeremiahu.com, and you can also check out some of my stand-up there. Uh, uh, so, yeah, you can see what I was talking about when I said I say opinions. <laughs> but, well, yeah, excited. thank you for having me, man. This is really fun. 
I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you, Jeremiah. Yeah, sweet. Thanks. Thank you so much.